to help us, to perfect us for our own works of ministry. And as long as we've been here, it's, man, I'll tell you, he comes with a word that just, it's right for us from the Lord for the season we're, we're in. And it's been like that every year. And so that's why we have him back every year. And so we're, we're excited to have him. Thank you, you man. Love Thank you, you. Praise God. If you're happy and you know it, shout amen. amen. Woo! Turn to somebody and say, I ain't scared. <laughs> you can be seated. That's why I like Arkansas, man. You come here, everybody, the church is packed. Man, we ain't scared. I love that. Woo! Have no reason to be, amen? So listen, we're, we're glad to be here with you. Give me just a little bit more of this in the house so I don't have to push. I can just talk comfortably. Amen? I'm, a, um, I'm basically a teacher by gifting, so I kind of start out slow, but we'll finish strong. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen, you know, over the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years or so, uh, we've been here, you know, pretty, pretty regularly. And uh, it's just so exciting to see where you are and where you've been and where you're going and so forth. And I'm glad we're all together this morning. You know, uh, one body. We're going to have a great time in here this morning. All right. I want to share some things with you. Uh, first of all, that I shared more in a private setting with some of the staff at a, an earlier time. But I just think it's important that you realize and we all realize uh, the significance of what we're a part of. How many of you believe you're in the right place at the right time with the right people? Yes. Man, I tell you, you are. You know, something very uh, uh, precious and dear to the heart of God is, is the local church. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, uh, when Jesus was speaking to Peter, he said, you know, this statement, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And ever since he uttered those words, he's been busy building his church, establishing his kingdom, the ecclesia, the elect. Those who are called out and separated from the world, separated unto his divine purpose, and empowered to establish his will and his kingdom in the earth. And a large part of that building program and process is the local church. You know, I don't know if most Christians understand this reality, but probably one of the most significant decisions you will ever make as a Christian is where you go to church. That one decision will have tremendous impact on your life, your family, your destiny, your future. Amen. So it's, it's, a, it's a very significant uh, decision. And, and along with that, it's important to realize in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, notice what the Bible says. God has set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased Him. Now, notice it doesn't say as it has pleased us, right? But as it has pleased him. The Moffat translation says, as we see, God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. How many of you know God is a God of order, man? He's not a God of chaos. He's got this thing planned out. And so when you come into the body of Christ, the Bible says God has a specific place for each one of us to be. And he's carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. So that tells me if God has placed me as a member of the body where he wants it, then where I go to church and where you go to church is not so much a matter of personal preference as much as it is a matter of divine placement and appointment. And, and listen, there are reasons for that. Amen? Every sheep needs a shepherd. This is God's plan. This is His way. And so as a Christian, God will place us in a local church under the, the care of a pastor where we can be fed the Word of God. We can grow up spiritually we can be nurtured and protected as a young believer. We can be encouraged and preserved as a mature believer. And where we can receive the necessary uh, revelation, knowledge, impartation, spiritual equipment, and so forth. Uh, that will keep us from the snares of the enemy. That will put us on the right path to fulfilling our divine purpose in life. Amen. Amen. So, you know, the local church is where each of us find our significance as a Christian. It's where our individual purposes 
are discovered within the context of the corporate purpose. How many of you know God never intended any one of us as, as a Christian to be an entity unto ourselves? If you're a believer, then your life, your purpose, and your destiny are interconnected with other Christians. So my life as a Christian and your life as a Christian can only find its true significance when we discover how we relate to the body of Christ as a whole. And that discovery primarily takes place within the context of the local church. So the local church, man, should be a place where we, uh, you know, establish relationships, where we encourage one another like we're doing this morning. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, stand with one another. We fellowship with one another. We exhort one another. As a matter of fact, over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, you know the, uh, the verse, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. I like the NIV. It says, let's not give up meeting together as, as some do. But let's encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I saw a little cartoon, you know, uh, and this person had passed away in the cartoon. And so they go up to the pearly gates and Peter's waiting there with the checklist, you know. And he says, well, I see here that you didn't actually uh, uh, attend the local church, but you did watch it on television. He said, so, you know, as a reward, you, you don't get to enter heaven, but you may watch it on television. <laughs> of course, we know that's a joke. But still, you know, there's something about being together. Uh, the reality is, friends, God will place you in a local church, as we said, to receive the impartations, the revelation of the things that you're going to need because he knows you. He knows your purpose. He knows your future. He knows your family. Did you know he'll also place you in churches where you can formulate divine connections and relationships? And those relations, some, uh, relationships sometime will help you greatly in life, will impact your children. It might be in business. It might be for kingdom purposes. But God gathers personal destinies to form corporate ones. So I, I am a strong advocate of the local church. And I just want you to realize, as I know you do, how significant uh, what you're a part of actually is. I was born and raised in the local church, man, raised Southern Baptist. I, I, I served in the local church all my life as a young man. I, I was trained in the local church. I met my wife in the local church. Our ministry was launched from the local church, and a large portion of our ministry today is still to the local church. Everybody say, thank God for the local church. Woo! So, of course, you understand, as we've already mentioned, there's not only personal destinies, but there are also corporate destinies. Corporate destinies. God uh, brings together local churches so that they can facilitate certain purposes within a community. Every uh, church, as we say, has its own unique spiritual DNA. You know what I'm talking about? And, and so thinking about that corporate destinies, I want to read you a, a passage of Scripture in Exodus 31. And I know your pastors and your leadership staff have articulated these things, but we're just reviewing them. And then we're going to move into the, the uh, crux of what we're actually going to do this morning. But in Exodus 31, 1 through 6, and also verse 11, Notice the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I've called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe tribe of Judah, I filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works and works of gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones, to set them and in the carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And behold, I've given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahishma, the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom. Notice that that they may make all that I have commanded thee. And then in verse 11, and the anointing oil and the sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, notice this, shall they do. How many of you have ever seen that scripture before? You've probably been brought to your attention. But notice God said to Moses, hey, 
I want you to build a, a tabernacle for me. I've got a vision uh, for you and I purpose for you. He said, but now I'm giving you the commission, but I'm going to surround you with people who have the gifts and the abilities and the talents and the resources to make that vision come into fruition. So the reality is when God calls a church, a pastor, places a vision in his heart, guess what? He simultaneously calls a people with the gifts and the abilities and the talents and the resources to facilitate that vision and bring it into fruition. That's why we know where we go to church is not exclusively a matter of personal preference as much as it is a matter of divine appointment and appointment and placement. If we're listening, because God is going to facilitate his visions. Woo! And they're great to be a part of it. So, you know, many times local churches are hindered in fulfilling their God-appointed uh, vision and assignment because the people that were assigned to that church leave. Sometimes because they get offended. Sometimes, you know, it's not their personal preference. Sometimes maybe, you know, the pastor didn't shake my hand or it's too loud or I don't like the carpet or the color of the seats. You know, things like this happen. You know, and unfortunately, when people abdicate their God appointed place, it can hinder the overall progress of his vision. So, you know, we want to stick together. Uh, I believe, you know, it's not about us. It's about him. Right. It's about his kingdom. It's about his vision. And so I, I personally believe there is an eternal reward for people who recognize their God appointed place of, of, of service and participation and they stick with it and they stay put. There's a blessing in this life and there's a blessing in the one to come. So I said all that to say this morning, man, you guys are in a great place. He did. Pastor didn't pay me to say this. We don't talk about what we're going to minister and what we're going to share. You're in a good place. I tell you, you're in a great season. Uh, as we've shared with you many times, and I know your pastors use this verse in Proverbs 4, 18. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. Man, it shines brighter and brighter until it reaches full strength at noonday. So we're going from glory to glory, faith to faith, strength to strength. Woo! And it's good. You're healthy. You know, as an itinerant, I can go into churches and you can discern the climate. Just after a little while of being up in front of people, you can discern, hey man, there's some big time strife going on here. or There's some stuff that's not right. You just know it. <laughs> that's what I do to my girls when I say, hey, mm -mm, don't mess with that. <laughs> so, Anyway, you can discern it, man. And it's good. Things are good. Matter of fact, you know, I, I, I don't try to always prophesy. <laughs> but sometimes it just comes up. You got to give it out. Stretch your hands out here just for a moment. Thank you, Lord. I just hear the Holy Ghost saying through the years, you've made steady progression toward the advancement of the vision that's been set before you. And even though at times from a natural perspective perhaps uh, that progression or forward momentum may have appeared to vacillate, know this, you are in perfect alignment and harmony with my times and seasons. As you well know, foundations take time to formulate and to uh, solidify uh, before the fullness of a building can be erected upon it. And so you've been in a season of solidification, uh, redirection in some areas, but also assessing where you are, where you're going. Uh, but, but be confident of this. I will perfect that which concerns you and this body of believers. And I will bring to full fruition the vision, the plan, and the purpose. Even though uh, from a natural perspective, sometimes things seem impossible. That's my specialty, saith God. Making impossible things possible. So 
Be confident and continue to move forward with a sense of expectation, anticipation, and internal confidence that all that has been spoken, decreed, declared, prophesied, prayed for, and envisioned in the heart, it will come to pass. And your hearts will be glad. And the hearts of those who are with you and walk beside you will likewise be glad. And uh, the impact of this mission, this ministry, this church will continue to increase. Not only in this city and in this region, but around the world, saith the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. How many of you believe it? Woo! Man, I tell you, it takes the pressure off when you know God's for you, right? And he's working. So listen, here's what we're going to do this morning. Just seemed good to me. I wanted to exhort you along some lines where the local church is concerned. But then I just had it in my spirit <laughs> that we should kind of redirect our gaze because of all the negativity that's going on. And man, we should just begin to call to mind the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, amen, in this house, both personally and corporately, and that we should celebrate it as a people this morning uh, in the sanctuary. So before, I guess we could say we're going to have a celebration service. But before we do, I want to lay a little groundwork so you know everything we do scriptural, right? Uh, so we'll just take a little time to do that and then we'll, we'll move forward. Uh, how many of you know in the Old Testament uh, there was a priesthood, right? And it was the responsibility of the priesthood to offer uh, sacrifices that were required as ordinances of worship under the Old Covenant. There were daily sacrifices, weekly sacrifices, annual sacrifices, wave offerings, grain offerings, sin offerings, offerings that were given for restored health. I mean, man, you name it, they had it. And it was the responsibility of the priesthood to offer those sacrifices to God on behalf of themselves and the people. Now, how many of you know that in the New Testament dispensation, the institution of the priesthood still exists? Did you know that? How do you know? Because the Bible tells us so. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, uh, excuse me, 1 Peter 2 and 9, notice uh, Peter writing, he said, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Man, I love that first song. I mean, y'all were led by the Holy Ghost. Didn't even know what I was going to minister on this morning. Woo! So, hey, guess what? Here we are in a New Testament dispensation. And guess what? The priesthood still exists. Did you know that you and I as the sons and daughters of God are the New Testament priesthood of God? And as the priesthood, it is still our responsibility to offer the sacrifices that are required as ordinances of worship under the new covenant. Right? Now, we understand these sacrifices are not the blood of bulls, goats, pigeons, and doves. Right? Because the sin offering in the New Testament has already been settled once and for all. How many of you realize in the Old Covenant, man, every year on the Day of Atonement, which means the Day of Payment or Compensation, every single year, they had to bring a sacrificial animal into the Holy of Holies there and sprinkle its blood on the mercy seat as payment for the sins of the people for one year. God said, we're going to do it every year until the final solution can come, which he did. Right? She shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sin. How? By shedding his own blood. The Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world shed his blood on the altar of the cross eternally purging and purchasing uh, the souls and purging the sins of every single person who will receive that sacrifice once and for all. 
Whew, how many of you have received that sacrifice? Glory to God, man. That's good news. So the sin offering never has to be offered again. And yet, there's still sacrifices that uh, have to be offered in the New Testament dispensation. Now, it's once again not the blood of bulls, pigeons, goats, or doves, right? What are they? Well, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 tells us. Notice. You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, yes, to offer up what kind of sacrifices? Spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So the sacrifices you and I are to offer are spiritual in nature and origin, right? So what are they? Aren't you glad the Bible tells us? One over in Romans chapter 12, one of the sacrifices, Romans 12, 1 through 2. Notice what Paul said. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. Right. One translation says your spiritual worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So one of the sacrifices that God asks us to make as the New Testament priesthood is our bodies, our lives, moment by moment, day by day, a living lifetime sacrifice. How many of you know worship is not an event? Right? Oh, let's go worship. I mean, it can be, but it's not exclusively an event. It's a lifestyle, man. From the time we open our eyes in the morning till the time we lay our head down at night, God said, I want you to live uh, your life as an honor to me, a living sacrifice. So we understand that. But the one we're going to camp on this morning, and you know, some services are uh, uh, primarily observational from your standpoint, Uh, but some are for participation, This morning, we're going to have some participation. So just get ready. Amen. So here's here's an additional sacrifice that as the priesthood, corporately and personally, we are expected to offer. Hebrews, you know it, 13 and 15. Hebrews 13 and 15. By Him, or by Jesus Christ, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, now He gives us explicit instruction as to what this sacrifice consists of. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto His name. So, the sacrifice of praise demands the expression of, Of the heart in thanksgiving to God through the lips or the mouth. Now we understand in our modern society, people want to substitute an external action for an internal response. It's all right to clap, enjoy yourself with the music and so forth. But when somebody says, hey, let's praise God. That's when the heart opens and the mouth opens. And we begin to tell God how much we are thankful to Him. Woo! Amen. Everybody say the fruit of my lips. That's one of our required sacrifices. And it's a good thing. Notice in Psalm 34 and verse 1. The psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be where? In my mouth. Notice the connection, right? Let me give you another one. Psalm 71 and verse 8. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your honor all the day. So, there's a connection between the heart and the mouth. Now, let me give you a few definitions just so that you know what we're going to do this morning. Scriptural. Uh, You know, in, in the Hebrew, the word praise has several About five different meanings or connotations. So we'll just mention both of those. Uh, The first meaning of praise in the Hebrew means to shine. Shine. So that has something to do with your countenance. Right? Uh, I mean, you cannot praise God with an old mully grub face. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. 
Really? I don't believe you. Right? Man, if you're going to praise God, there ought to be a little shining on the countenance. <laughs> so to shine. Then it says to, uh, to make a show. Make a show. I mean, obviously, when people are praising God, something is going on. I mean, if you're going to make a show, it's something that people can see. You know what I'm saying? So you say, well, what does that mean? Well, just hold on. I'll be demonstrating. Amen. <laughs> to shine. To make a show. To boast. That's the third one. To boast. Man, what does it mean to boast? Well, when you boast about someone, you're talking about how awesome they are. How faithful you are. How mighty you are. How unconquerable you are. Woo! To boast. To shine. To make a show. To boast. Now here's the fourth one. It means to celebrate. The word praise in the Hebrew has the meaning of celebrate. Now have you ever seen anybody celebrate? I know most churches think you should just sit there like a graveyard. But now we understand being reverent. I love that. And we're going to experience the presence of God tonight. But you know, God is multifaceted in His expressions. And he, and he made us the same way. So you know, when somebody celebrates, which is one of the aspects of praise. What do you guys like around here? Football? Soccer? What is it? Football? I mean, you know, people go to the game. And man, their favorite team's playing. And the guy's running down the field. And, whoo, man, he makes a touchdown. Now, if you are a fan, right, a bona fide fan, when he makes that touchdown, you don't sit there and say, well, isn't that wonderful, Martha? <laughs> he made a touchdown. woo Is that how you act? Man, if you're a fan... And if you're enthusiastic like I am about stuff, I mean, when your team makes a touchdown and, boy, and it's close, I mean, you get up, man, you're jumping around. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're dancing. Whoa. You're hugging people. Right? You're excited. That's what fans do. And nobody thinks it's abnormal at all. Why? Oh, they're a fan, man. They're, they're crazy. Guess what? Jesus did a lot more than run down a field with a bag of wind. I mean, he saved us, redeemed us. Oh, he deserves a little celebration. And it's all right to get happy in church. Amen. Now, some people are critical. Oh, that's just a bunch of emotionalism and nonsense. But that same person will go home on Sunday afternoon football with a Dr. Pepper and a bag of chips. We'll give you the benefit of a doubt, Dr. Pepper and a bag of chips. <laughs> and, and sitting there watching the football game. And man, their team, you know, scores. They come out of that chair going wild. What's the difference? They're a fan. Well, I'm a fan of Jesus. Anybody in the room a fan of Jesus? So it's okay to celebrate a little bit. So to shine, man, to make a show, uh, to boast, to celebrate. And then the final meaning uh, of it, of course, gets back to the mouth. And it is uh, the, uh, to commend or speak favorably of. So that means, you know, telling him. How much you appreciate all he's done for you. Thank you, Lord. You called me out of darkness into light. Thank you that you made us new creations. Thank you that you've raised us up and made us sit in heavenly places. Thank you that you've redeemed us from the curse of the law. Thank you. Thank you. You gave us life. Eternity with you. Right? And then the Greek, and this gets personal here. The Greek meaning is the genuine that means heartfelt confession of facts in one's life that brings glory to God. So that means what he's done for you personally when he saved you. 
when he filled you with the Spirit, or when he healed your body. Has anybody in this room genuinely ever been healed from, from a, a sickness or infirmity? Raise your hand. Let me just see. I mean, people have been healed. Right? When he helped you financially, man, uh, p- make your mortgage payment or your house payment or your, your car payment. Man, you didn't know how you were going to do it. Or saved your kids or turned your marriage around or, man, blessed you. Right? And giving him thanks for it. That's called the sacrifice of praise. So guess what we're going to do this morning? We're going to offer the sacrifice of praise. Amen. Now you say, well, why are we going to do that? Look here. First Chronicles 16, 34. The Bible says, oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he's good, man. He's worthy of it. For his mercy endures forever. Look at Psalm 92 in verse 1. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. Now, I love this particular translation of that verse in the Living Bible. Psalm 92, 1 through 2. Listen to what the psalmist said. It is good to say thank you to the Lord. To sing praises to God who is above all gods. Now, watch this. Every morning, tell him, thank you for your kindness. And every evening, rejoice In all of his faithfulness. Here's another one. Psalm 35 and 28. My tongue shall speak of thy righteousness. And of thy praise. All the day long. Now listen to the living Bible of this. I love it. The psalmist said. I will keep to myself. All the things the Lord has done. Is that what it says? No. I will tell everyone. How great. And how good you are. I will praise you all day long. Woo-hoo! So guess what we're going to do? We're going to tell everybody how good he's been. In a moment now, we're going to stand in this place. And on the count of three, we're going to lift our voices in a shout of praise to God. Maybe you're relatively new, man. You've never shouted before. Well, you'll enjoy it. You know the old, tu- the old detergent says for the tough stain, shout it out, right? Sometimes, man, you just need to shout. You say, well, now why do we have to shout? Friends, I don't know. God likes it. He likes it. How do you know he likes it? Because if you read the Old Testament, every time, just about every time, he'd give a battle plan to the children of Israel. He'd say, now do this, 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 and then shout. He liked to end it with a shout. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. He said, now six days you walk around that thing. Don't say a word. Just make the devil nervous. (laughs) Don't say a word, he said, you know. And then he said, now on the seventh day, you, you go around that thing six times. And then on the seventh time, the, the priests are going to blow those trumpets. And when they do, you let out a shout. He likes it. But I'll tell you something beside that. There's something that happens in the atmosphere. When you really release a voice of triumph, man, it does something. We're going to scare every devil in Alma this morning. With a shout of praise from beyond church. And you know when they shouted, man, those walls came down. I mean, with Israel and the Philistines, the Joshua and Jericho, uh, you know, what a Gideon and the Midianites. I mean, there's always a shout involved. So we're going to start off this morning just giving God a shout of praise and thanksgiving corporately for what he's done. And, all, and I know you guys testify of the goodness of God. And you put that on your website, I think, and stuff like that probably. But you know what we're going to do corporately this morning after we give that shout of praise? Then I'm going to ask different ones of you as your heart prompts you. We're going to take a few on this side, a few on that side. We're going to have our music going. I'm going to ask you to come up here and do what? I will tell everybody how good you've been to me. If he has healed you, 
If he delivered you, man, from drugs or alcohol or depression or whatever it it was. Did you know when you tell other people, you not only glorify God, but you encourage them. Right? And so sometimes we just need to tell people. Tell it. Right? And so I'll have different ones of you come. And now listen. Don't sit there and look at me. Because this is a participator service. And I'll say this as nice as I can. We're not looking for a mini sermon. I don't want your latest revelation from the scripture. Right? I want you to come like the newspaper. Headlines. Headlines. You know, like they say with the mini skirt. It's got to be, uh, you know, it's got to be short enough to be interesting, but long enough to cover the subject, right? And that would, something like that. So, you know, you got to make it concise, but give us enough information, all right? And we, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I'm so sorry. I must have heard that years ago. I don't know. But anyway. And when you come up here, man, and you, you what? You offer your sacrifice of praise as one of the members of the priesthood in the sanctuary. Then we, as the additional priesthood and sons and daughters, we're going to celebrate with you. Man, we're going to get excited. We're going to make a show. We're going to what? Today we're emphasizing the goodness of God. Getting our eyes off all this junk and just magnifying our God, our King, our Savior. All right? So we'll start off with a corporate shout. I'm going to ask different ones of you to come, you know, and, and, you, and I'll hold the microphone. That way if it get too long, I can <laughs> dance away. Right? I'll hold the microphone. <laughs> and you come tell us, man, how good he's been. How's that sound? So we'll praise him for what he has done. We'll praise him for what he is doing. And then also, we're going to give a final praise in anticipation of what we expect to come. Because you know there is that facet of praise. There's power in praise when it's from the heart. Lillian B. Yeoman said, hey, she said, you know, praise accelerates victory. There's something about praising God before maybe you see the manifestation that tends to activate things in the unseen realm. So, uh, man, can we celebrate him today? Will you participate? Okay, I heard that. All right. So think about something good God has done for you. Think about the headlines, right? And then we're going to give God some praise. And then we're going to give a final praise in anticipation Of everything he started here, guess what? He's going to finish it. Everything he's begun, you've set your faith upon as a final praise. We're going to praise him in advance, believing that is coming to pass. Everybody stand up. I'm going to need that uh, additional microphone. Is it on? All right. Okay, it's testing. All right, so here we go. Now make sure, I, yeah, I'm good. Bring us up just a little bit more in this monitor so I can hear when it's, you know, just a little bit. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. All right, guys, are you ready? Yeah. This is Participation Sunday. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Are you ready to give him a shout? Yeah. All right, now don't be looking around. You just close your eyes and let her rip, <laughs> right? This is your time to say, hey. I want to thank you. And man, just start it with a big old shout. Are you ready? One, two, three. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Give 
him glory. I tell you, he's been good to us. Give him glory. Give him praise. Hey, you woke me up this morning. Started me on my way. Give him the glory. Come on. Hey, give him praise. You know something? You got a right to praise him. You got a right to. I know y'all can put a little shine on your face, can't you? Come on, you got to shine a little bit. Some of you still got that mully grub look. Come on. Hey, come on, let's shine in here. Hey, you woke me up this morning. Started me on my way. Give him the glory. Give him. All right, now we're going to bring it down just a little bit so I can talk to you for a minute. All right? Now, listen, I want somebody to come up here and testify. A few of you line up over here. If you're here, I'll call you one at a time. Come on, somebody. All right, brother, come on up here. Tell us how good he's been. I'll hold the microphone. You do that. Hey, many of you all may know this, but uh, my daughter was pretty much brought back death to life this last year. Hey, I'm still excited about that. <laughs> you know this, don't you? You know this. Hey, you know. Oh, you want to hold it? Sorry about that. Airlifted from, from right back here to Little Rock. Split her head open. She's got no brain damage, no nerve damage. She can do everything she used to do. She's as ornery as ever. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Come on. Somebody better get down here. Come on. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Tell us how good he's been to you. We shared that miracle this weekend with some friends of ours. They were completely amazed. But this week, God finalized the adoption of the kids he brought to us for a total of six kids. <laughs> Come on, stand right here. Tell us how good he's been to you. He's been so good. I had a financial need come up, and instead of stress, I went to God, and he provided. My boss, just within a matter of days, came to me with a side job. He thought of me first, wanted to offer it to me first, and because it took longer than he thought, I got to do it during my regular working hours, so I got paid twice for the same hours, then got paid more money because it took too long. <laughs> good. Come on, let's give a sacrifice of praise. Tell us how good he's been to I just want to thank the Lord because my God is good. He is, I had a back accident. I had three herniated discs and they took them out, used them together, done a bunch of surgery, took pain pills, and taken them for four or five years. But God works in his mysterious ways. I do not take no pain pills. I do not walk with no crutch. I do not take nothing. I trust in my God and my Savior. And I tell you again, my wife was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. And she was her heart was pumping 15%. And her heart doctor come in there three days later and said, woman, what have you done? He said, there ain't nothing that medicine that no doctor, no man can do. But your heart has went from pumping 15% to 55%. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> come on, give me a few more. Somebody get down here and get ready to testify. Come on, come get in line. Hurry up. Tell us how good he's been to you. God has healed my back. Last year, I wouldn't have been able to walk up these stairs. I just praise him. It is, yes. God is so good. Yes, <laughs> Thank is. you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He heals the back. Amen. Come on, bro. Tell us. Come on, give me a few more. I know God's done some things in this house. Come on. Stand right here and tell me how good it's been. All right. You want a headline? This one's going to read, Blood Covenant Comes Through Again. So we basically had a sick little girl uh, that just come up with this fever out of nowhere, or uh, Ava. And uh, just in me, the, the Lord said, call upon the covenant. And so I love that, that we can stand on behalf of our kids uh, who may not completely understand that. And it's like, no, Lord, the covenant, for Jesus' sake, you're going to do this because 
You said so. Yes. And so in just a matter of days, fever gone, she's back to normal, and I don't care what it was, but the blood covenant comes through again. Yes. Come, <laughs> Come tell us how good he's been, honey. All I have to say is that he has helped me through so much. And when I was in the dark, he picked me up and put me in the light. That's all I have to say. Hallelujah. Come on, bro. Hey, yeah. Woo. Tell us how good he's been. So I, with the help of the Lord, has, has defied every status quo that was placed on my life. Every word that was spoken over me negative, we've overcome it and conquered it. Yeah. And now we're successful, we're thriving, my kids, and we broke every generational curse that's ever been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell us how good he's been to you. I work for the government, and they combine two agencies, and I got a $3,500 raise beginning March 1st. <laughs> Come on, sweetheart. Tell us how good he's been to you. Man, this is called the sacrifice of praise. Tell us how good he's been. Okay, so um, I've been having a lot of back pain and kidney pain, and a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Evan prayed with me, and I haven't had any pain since then. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how good he's been, man. Um, I'm a basketball coach. I've been coaching 14 years, and this year uh, was a season of victory for me. Um, opportunity to give God glory in, uh, in a locker room, in a community, and uh, just super thankful for the favor of the Lord, the things that he's put on my life this year, and to not grow weary, to not give up, because the harvest uh, definitely came this year, and I'm thankful. Glory to God, man. Pastor, tell us how good he's been. Okay, so I was in the car yesterday, right in the passenger seat. My head was hurting, and I was just kind of like zoned out. And my, my youngest boy said, Dad, I think we should just pray for you. And he led out in a prayer that was not only amazing, but so powerful. My head, I'm not going to instantly heal, but the, i got to give God praise that, that I can hear him, but my children can too. Hallelujah. Hey! Come on, we'll take this one. We'll take one more. Come on. Tell us how good he's been to you. All right, so most of you guys know I had an autoimmune disease, and so he healed me from that. And this was like, I don't know, like however many years ago, 2008, you had us do this, and I prophesied over it. And so anyways, delivered from that. Uh, I pretty much came back from death also. So, uh, Somebody ought to praise him a little bit. Oh, she got one more. And uh, also just our marriage and our family. I mean, huge. Huge! Glory to God. <laughs> Come on. Woo! God healed me and, <clears throat> sorry, me and Josh from depression and healed our marriage. And now we're going to have another beautiful baby. And Blue just walks around saying, I love Jesus. I love to worship. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. <laughs> That's beautiful. Praise God. Come on. We'll take this one. Oh, come on, baby. Yeah, tell us. Tell us how good the Lord is. I got hurt in basketball, and my friend named Avery prayed for me, and then that night my leg was better. Hallelujah! Amen. Oh, come on. Praise God. Isn't it good to hear? Tell us how good he's been. So most of you know all the kids from children's classes have been praying for students at school. Um, but my middle daughter started a prayer box in her classroom for kids to come and put prayers in that box. And her teacher, Miss Gillingham, has been sending them to us so she can pray for um, whoever puts them in there. But we've already seen so many people just affected from this little prayer box um, and the idea of a prayer box. And then they did a poem in class, and at the bottom it said, I will follow Jesus. <laughs> it's just so amazing to see our kids just getting it and going with it and the lives that they're impacting because not only is it kids, but it's building our faith and our boldness to go out and be that too. Beautiful. Hallelujah. We'll take one more. One more here. You coming to testify? Come on right here, honey. Tell us how good the Lord's been. Mine's uh, very similar to Pastor Nate's. I woke up a uh, day before yesterday with a really bad migraine, throwing up, couldn't take my oldest to school, and 
my littlest, my seven-year-old, came up to me and said, Mommy, can I lay hands on you and pray for you? And I said, absolutely. He laid hands on me, spoke the word, and migraine gone. Thank you. (laughs) He's got one more. Come on, man. He's got another one. Hallelujah. Okay, I've been been diagnosed with prostate cancer. I just finished eight weeks of radiation therapy with no side effects. (laughs) That's a miracle. All right, guys, listen up now. We said we're going to shout for what he has done, praising him personally for what he's done. But now this is our praise of faith. How many of you got some things you need to see come into manifestation? Really? This is reality. So here's what we're going to do. Having not seen yet believing, we're going to rejoice with joy unspeakable. So here's the question. You've heard it said, your celebration is a demonstration of your faith in the fact. God's heard your prayer. The answer's on the way. So how would you praise Him? How would you demonstrate that? If you knew you had the answer, just go ahead and show him. (laughs) Hallelujah! Some of you ought to get a little more happy than you are. (laughs) I tell you, it's been good, but the best is yet to come. Woo! Hallelujah. Listen, we love you. And just keep praising Him, man. Keep that sacrifice flowing. I'm going to turn it back to Pastor. And then whatever. All right. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Yeah, keep that music going. Hey, I'll tell you what. This is, praise stills the enemy. I'm telling you, this is is such a word of the Lord to us. When you get at home in your car. When you, or, or you're in your car. I guess you wouldn't be at home in your car, but... You praise him. I'm telling you, oh, and you know what the deal is? He said it. The inward, there's an inward that has to be an outward. Not an outward demonstration, but it takes our voice. It takes our voice. And using our voice. Praise the Lord. And praise the Lord. So I want to remind you again, as you're dismissed uh, to this morning, uh, service tonight at 630, but also tomorrow night at 7 uh, online. But have your kids there. Um, we're going to receive communion together, and we're just, just a deposit, just a promise. And I'll tell you what, there's something about just your kids just grabbing a hold of the Word. A lot of times they'll grab it, and they'll hold you to it. I'm telling you, it's amazing. So God bless you guys. Thanks for coming, and uh, you're healed. <laughs> See y'all.